talking to a man to church this morning. We're going to start by praising God. So let's see those hands up. Come on. Let's see. This is where my heart will beat again. This is where I get set free. This is where your love is calling me. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready to cross over the line. Leave it all behind. Nothing's gonna keep me here. Oh, until I see a change, I'm lifting up your name. There's freedom in the atmosphere.
deeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working because even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Just even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I'm going to talk to you today about soul anchors, three places that you can put your hope in, in these uncertain times. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to get into it. Thank you, Jesus for your promise, your presence and your peace. I pray for every person watching right now, whether they know you or they don't, that they experience all three this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you help them as you've helped me and as you've helped every generation before us. In the name of Jesus, 
Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, I'm going to talk to you, like I just said, about anchors for the soul, our soul anchors. And the words that I just said at the start there were actually written 147 years ago, if you can believe that, by a guy called Horatio Spafford. It's a great name. And um, in 1873, him and his family, his wife and his four children lived in Chicago. He was a wealthy lawyer and businessman, and he'd um, had a lot of property in Chicago. But actually, two years earlier, he'd lost most of it in what was known as the Great Chicago Fire. And he thought that him and his family really deserved a breakaway. And um, he was going to send them off to the UK with him to go and see his good friend D.L. Moody preach. But something happened with one of his business deals that meant that he was unable to go at that time. And so he sent off his wife and his four daughters and they made the long journey from Chicago to New York to then head over the sea to the UK. Unfortunately, what happened during that journey at about two o'clock in the morning was their ship was rammed by another ship. And as It was, you know, no one was there to help them. All 226 people on board perished. There were only a few who survived. Horatio's wife, Annie, she only just survived by floating on a piece of debris that was there and she was rescued. But Horatio's four girls, Annie, Maggie, Bessie and Tanetta perished. Horatio's wife made it over to England and she sent a now famous telegram to him that said, saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio, of course, was devastated and made his way over to the UK as quick as he could. And as he was making that same journey that his wife and children had made and where his daughters had perished, the captain of the ship that he was on came to him and said, this is the spot, Horatio. This is where the ship went down. And at some point in his journey over the Atlantic, Horatio Spafford wrote these words, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When I read that story recently, my first question was, how? How on earth does somebody who has experienced that amount of tragedy over the spot where his daughters perished, how is he writing words like that? And I think it's because he had an anchor for his soul. What allowed him to do that in the midst of unimaginable loss was the truth that is immovable and was firm in his life. Now, hopefully you're not going through the same level of loss today that Horatio was. Maybe you are. But I wonder, in times of crisis, when things are difficult, when things are out of the ordinary and things are not as we expected them to be, it's a great time to ask the question of ourselves, what is my soul anchored to? Now, if you know and love Jesus and have done for any time, I'm not going to say anything that you're going to go, wow, Julie, that's new this morning. But hopefully it will remind you and refresh you of truth that is already established in your life. Perhaps if you're a new Christian, You're in a bit of a difficult spot at the minute, but I'm encouraging you today that there's new truth that you can find as an anchor for your soul today in the middle of tough times that later on in your life, you'll look back on and be thankful that you put an anchor down during these difficult times. And maybe today you're watching this live stream and you don't know Jesus. You've stumbled on it somehow, a friend shared it and you found yourself watching. Well, today I want to talk to you as well. I know that we all find ourselves in crazy, unfamiliar, painful, difficult, and sometimes hopeless times. And let me encourage you, you today, this is the time for you to grab hold of an immovable anchor that is going to help you in the storm of life. So this morning, I want to talk to you really quickly about three soul anchors, three sure foundations that you can count on in the middle of a trial or a tough time, whatever that looks like for you today. The first is this, our first soul anchor are the promises of God. Let me read to you in Hebrews 6, 19, it says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. 
It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. And it starts by saying we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And I always think when I read something, well, what hope is he talking about? Or when we look a few verses earlier, the writer of Hebrews is actually talking about the promise that God made to Abraham that he was going to make his descendants as many as the sand on the seashore. And then it says this interesting thing about how God swore that he was going to do that by himself because there was nobody else greater that he could swear on. It was like God was playing a top trump. I'm going to swear on myself because no other thing can be higher than me. And so God has made this promise to Abraham and that's the hope that the writer is talking about here. He's talking about the promises of God. And it actually says that God gave this promise so that when we take hold of the promise, that we can be greatly encouraged. That's what the verses earlier say. That's what the writer of Hebrews tells us. And that's such a great truth that the hope that is an anchor for our soul are the promises of God. They're the anchor that is immovable. It creates a fixed point that when the storms of life come, that stays firm when everything else around us is not firm. We can count and we can depend on the promises of God. Well, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you know what I'm talking about. You've got promises from God. Let me encourage you. Now is the time to get those promises out, to reread them, to redeclare them, put them up around your home, sing over them, worship to them and use those promises as an anchor for your soul. If you're a new Christian, you're thinking, Julie, I don't have a promise from God. I don't really know what that looks like. Now's a great time to lay hold of a promise. We do that by reading God's Word, by spending time in His presence, by worshipping and finding something in His Word that is just for us, unique to us. And if you don't have one, let me encourage you, God has a promise for you. So be diligent, seek after it, go after the promise of God. And maybe... Today, you don't yet know Jesus. I want to tell you that He loves you. He cares for you. And when we know Him and respond to Him, the Bible tells us that He gives us His great and precious promises so that we can access the divine nature, Peter tells us. And so maybe you're thinking, well, Jude, I don't even know Jesus. How can He have a promise for me? The promise of God in the Word of God to you is He's got promises just waiting for you so that you can access the nature of God. That's the first anchor of our soul, the promises of God. The second anchor of our soul is the presence of God. When we look at the life of Joseph, obviously a main character within the Bible, somebody that's very famous. He had that technical dream coat that you might have heard about. His life, when we look at it, was not going to plan. He had serious family aggro. His brothers were trying to kill him. They put him in a pit. That's not a normal thing to do. He got sold into slavery. He was then bought and put in position of authority in someone's house. He was then falsely accused. He got thrown into prison. Somebody in prison said, oh, I'll help you out when I get out. And then they totally forgot for two years. He had a really rough life at the start that was not what he expected, that was not what he thought was going to happen, that was not how he wanted his life to be. But in that account in Genesis 38, what you see are some words that are continually repeated. And it says this, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. And it actually repeats it five times. That's an anchor for our soul, the presence of God, the fact that God is with us. It's an immovable truth that holds us firm and sure. Now, it may not feel like it. It may not look like it. I'm sure if we talk to Joseph, he would say, there were times when I was falsely accused, when my brothers were trying to kill me, when I was forgotten about, that it did not feel like God was with me. But the Word of God says that the Lord was with him. His circumstances didn't show that, but the truth and the anchor of his soul was that God actually was there the whole time. The Lord is with you this morning. His presence never, ever leaves us. And if you're a mature Christian, if you've been a Christian a long time, you may be experiencing a trial right now. You may have lost your job. Family members may be sick. You may be struggling. 
There may be any number of different things going on. I encourage you, if you've known Jesus for any length of time, the anchor for your soul right now is his presence. I want you to look back over all the time that you've known Jesus. And even though there were ups and there were downs, there were highs and there were lows, I want you to look back and see the fact that the Lord was with you. He never left you. If you're a new Christian, this is actually one of the hardest lessons that we have to learn because we're so used to going off our experience. We're used to going off what we can see and touch and feel and our mind, our will and our emotions when things are difficult are all over the show and they can often lie to us. This is the time to sink an anchor for your soul in the truth of God's Word that His presence is always with us. The Lord was with him. The Lord is with you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. Maybe today you don't know Jesus yet and you're thinking, well, Julie, I don't even know what the presence of God feels like. You're saying that God can be with me, but I don't even know what that would look like or feel like. And how could God be with me? I don't even like Him that much. I'm not even interested in Him. Well, today I want to tell you and remind you that God loves you. The Bible says He's loved you with an everlasting love. He is for you. And even if your life is away from Him and you are not considering God, that does not change how He feels towards you. His presence can be with you. When you say yes to Jesus, you can lay hold of that truth and that anchor for your soul that He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His presence can always be with you. And that's what He wants for you. He will not force it. He will not force his presence into your life. But the invitation comes to you today. And I'm going to give you an opportunity later to invite Jesus into your life so that he doesn't ever have to leave you. The second anchor is the presence of God. The third anchor for our soul is the peace of God. Right before Jesus went to the cross and he was about to die a horrific death, He said these words to his closest friends in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you like the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. I don't know about you, but those words really speak to me at the moment. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus knew that the next three days for these disciples, his closest friends, there was going to be a lot of trouble and they were going to be really afraid. He knew what they needed. He knew that they needed peace. And so he promised them, I'm going to leave my peace with you. When I go, I'm not just going to leave you alone, but I'm going to leave the peace of God with you. He knew that for the early Christians, that they were going to face intense and severe persecution. He knew that they were going to need peace. Peace that passes understanding, peace that guards our hearts and minds, peace like a river that attends our way. And whether you've known God a lifetime, a week, or you've not yet said yes to Him, an anchor for our soul can be and is the peace of God. It's not based on circumstances lining up and being as we'd want them to be. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on our thoughts or our emotions. It's not based on anything else other than who he is. The Bible calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. He is the author of peace and he has an unlimited supply. We have got limited supplies all over the show at the minute, haven't we? But the peace of God is not in limited supply for you or your life. When I was researching for this message, one of the really interesting things that I found was that for the early Christians on their tombs and in the catacombs, you don't see the international symbol of Christianity today. You don't really see crosses. Or if you do, they're they're kind of um, hidden a little bit so that they were secret because being a Christian in the early days was a very risky thing to do. People could shop you in and you could be killed publicly for your faith, for who you chose to believe in. And so you don't see very many crosses. What you do see a lot of is a symbol of an anchor. And I think it's so interesting that people who are enduring circumstances that were not how they would choose it to be, chose an anchor 
as their symbol of their faith. Anchors of his promises, anchors of his presence, anchors of his peace. What anchors someone's life who at any moment can be arrested and fed to lions in front of thousands of other people just for sport, for believing in something that wasn't allowed at that time? What anchors a father who lost his four children for no good reason and allows him to write words like, it is well with my soul? What anchors our life when things are difficult and not as we would want them to be? It's not our jobs. It's not our family. It's not our health. It's not positive thinking. It's not holding it together. It's not just powering through and getting through it. It's not hoping for the best. What is the sure and certain anchor for our life is Jesus. And if you're a Christian today, I want to remind you of who He is, that He is faithful, that He's promised His presence, that He's promised His peace, that the Word of God is full of promises for you and your life. Whether you've been a Christian a long time or a short time, you can dig into his presence and his promise and his peace at this time and it can carry you through when everything else around you looks like it's spinning out of control. That can be the immovable point is Jesus. But maybe today you're watching and you're not a Christian. You've never yet said yes to Jesus. I want you to know today that he is calling you. He wants you. He wants to guide you. He wants to fill your life with hope and joy and love and peace. He wants to give you his presence. He wants to talk to you about the promises that he has for your life. He wants to give you peace that passes anything that you can understand about your life. But he will not force himself into your life. He must be invited in. You must ask him to come. He's not going to override your free will and do something weird. But He does want to be invited into your life. So today, if you're watching this and you want to receive His presence, you want to have Jesus. Maybe you've tried everything else and it's not worked. And maybe during this difficult time, everything else has fallen away. And you're looking around at your life thinking, there's nothing left in my life. Well, let me tell you today, When you accept Jesus, everything can be stripped away, but He remains. So I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me if that's you and you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. I'm going to pray that. But if you're a Christian and you're watching, I wonder if you just pray now. There'll be lots of people watching this right now who don't know Jesus. I wonder if you'd pray for them too. So if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, would you pray with me today? Jesus, I don't want to do life on my own. I recognise that I need You. I need a Saviour. I haven't got it all together, but I want to give my life to You. I want to receive Your promises. I want to experience Your presence that is never going to leave me. And I want to live in Your peace that passes my understanding. I pray that You accept me now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed that for the first time, we're going to talk to you in just a moment about how we'd love to connect with you. We're going to take communion together in just a moment, church, and Pastor Mark is going to come and lead us through that. But as we get ready for that, the band are going to sing a song. If you haven't yet got your communion ready, why don't you go and do that right now? Grab some water or juice or crackers or bread, whatever you've got to symbolise the body and the blood of Jesus. And we're going to take communion together. If you've already got that prepared, then why don't you worship as the band lead us together? Come on, let's sing Our God is Greater. Our God is greater than all things, greater than all things, greater than
is here right now oh, he has broken every chain and we are free is worthy. What great, great words. Julie, that was just an amazing message. We're going to come around a time of communion. And communion is something that was purposed. Jesus purposely and deliberately set up communion saying, do this to remember me. As often as you gather, remember me. So it's something that Jesus instituted and we're going to do that right now. We're going to remember something about Jesus that's going to help us. I'd like to remember the time that Jesus calmed the storm. So we have the, the, the situation, the apostles and they're, they're in the boat and it says that Jesus is asleep in the stern as his, was his customary place and He has asleep on a cushion. So there he's asleep on the cushion and it says uh, suddenly a big squall comes. And you see the picture, they're, they're a kind of experienced fishermen. They're not scared over just some kind of little bit of waves. They've seen it all before. But all of a sudden this storm comes, this squall comes, and it's so bad that they're fearing for their lives. They're fearing that they're going to drown. These experienced fishermen who knew Galilee, knew the Lake of Galilee, and, and they're, they're worried. And they sit there and they see Jesus asleep in the, in the stern of the boat. And you can imagine they're sitting there thinking, do we wake Him up? Do we not wake Him up? You wake Him up. I, I'm not going to wake Him up. <coughs> you, you, you wake Him up. And, and they're having this argument about who they were. But, but He's tired. He's just been ministering all the time. Obviously, He's tired. Should we, should we do so? And we're kind of like thinking, what, what, what do they do? And, and we're showing that picture. And eventually one of them gets the courage and they, they wake him up. Sometimes when we're going through something, we go through that same sort of thing. Do I wake Jesus up? Uh, is, is Jesus sick? Maybe other people need a miracle more than I need a miracle. Uh, uh, this is only a little thing. Maybe this is just something I should get through. But sometimes we've got to wake Jesus up. You know, the Bible says, you know, you ask, you seek, you knock. And when you ask, you will get. When you seek, you will receive. When you, when you knock, the door will be open to you. You've sometimes got to actually do something. So eventually, one of them gets the courage and they, they wake Jesus up. And Jesus is kind of like, oh, wow, you know, there's, there's a storm. And He's going, oh, you guys. And He just rebukes. He goes, wind be still, waves kind of calm down. And all of a sudden, the storm just goes away. I've actually been on a boat on a very calm Sea of Galilee. It literally is one of the most peaceful places on the earth. And I love the fact that God is able at a word to turn the biggest turmoil into one of the most peaceful places. That's one of the things that He can do. 
But this is one of the things I would actually say to you. The storm wasn't the actual issue. They say, Jesus, didn't you care that we would drown? They, they had a wrong concept. And sometimes we see the storms of our lives as God not caring or, or God kind of just leaving us alone. It's so the opposite. Jesus knew while He was in that boat asleep, nothing was going to happen. They were never, ever going to drown. They actually didn't need to wake Jesus up because He was in their boat. They were actually in the safest place on the planet at that moment because Jesus was never going to drown. He was never going to allow that to happen. And I just want to remind you, whatever you're going through right now, Jesus is in your boat. It may seem as if He's asleep. It may seem like He doesn't care, but Jesus cares. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that what you're going through now isn't going to drown you, isn't going to overwhelm you, isn't going to kind of just put you in a place where you're in a bad, bad place. This morning, I want you to get your communion. I've actually got a mini Jats cracker. How cool is that? That is cool communion, right? I don't know what you have. I've got a mini Jats, right? And what I want you to, to do this day is I want you to take this and remember that Jesus can calm your storm, that Jesus can turn the raging turmoil of your life into a place which there's peace. Let's take that right now. I want you to take whatever juice that you have. I have it in a nice glass. You might have it in the egg cup. I don't know. But what this does is it says that God's coming of the storm is for everyone. The blood of Jesus makes us all equal. He doesn't have favourites. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to do something for Neil, but I'm not going to do it for Tom. I'll do something for, for Mary, but I'm not going to do it for Miriam. Right? The blood of Jesus makes us all equal. So let's see that today. Whatever storm you're going through, God wants to calm it. He wants to speak to it. He wants to bring peace. Let's take of His blood. Father, I pray for every storm that people are going through right now. It's a stormy time for our world right now. There's uncertainty. We don't know. And, and Lord, I pray for everyone who's feeling like they could drown. Feeling right now that you don't care. Feeling right now that you're somehow distant, oh God. Father, I pray as, as Julie preached so well today that, that something would come inside their spirit that would say, it is well. It is well. It is well. That they'd be anchored to your love today. Father, we just honour You in Jesus' Name. Amen. I do want to take a moment and pray for specific things. Maybe you've got a healing need right now. Maybe you're feeling sick. Maybe you have a financial need right now. Maybe there's a relational need. Maybe there's a fear. There are many, many things that you could have right now. I want you to put your hand on that particular area. Maybe if it's something of your thought life, maybe if it's just something of, of faith where, the, where you can't actually put your hand. But I want you to do something right now. I want you to put your faith in action. If you can, put your hand on something. If you can, stand. If you can do something, but do something right now as I pray. Let your faith move into something. Father, I pray for every person who is sick. I pray that You would bring healing right now in Jesus' Name. I speak to that condition. I rebuke that infirmity and I speak healing right now in the Name of Jesus. Father, where there needs to be provision, I pray provision right now in the Name of Jesus. Where there needs to be peace, Father, I pray peace right now. Where there needs to be, oh God, a reconciliation, I speak reconciliation, oh God. Father, where there is fear, I come against it right now in the Name of Jesus every household, in every room. Let faith rise, oh God, and a gratefulness to who You are and for what You've done. You are a good God. And Father, we put our anchor in You. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Pastor Julie's going to come right now with some announcements. 
Well, we're so glad that you chose to be with us today. We want to say thank you to each and every one of you that is continuing to give. We know that for many of you, this is now a faith step. And so we want to thank you for doing that. All the details, if you do want to give to church, are along the bottom of your screen right now. You can use text or you can do bank transfer or you can go to immersechurch.life with all the details. I remember if you want to give to our specific fund that is helping people, who are in need because of the coronavirus situation, all you need to do is label your giving coronavirus or CV19 or something like that. And we will make sure it gets to people who really need it. Well, maybe today you prayed that prayer with me just a few moments earlier. You invited Jesus into your heart. We don't want to leave you on your own with that. We wanna help you and give you some next steps that you can take. And so we'd love you to go to emergechurch.life and let us know that you made that decision today. We've got really friendly people who wanna help you take your next step, obviously by phone or by the internet. We're not gonna come around to your house and do that, but we do wanna help you make that not just a one-time decision, but a lifestyle that you walk out as you follow Jesus. You can also connect with us at emergechurch.life if you want to join a life group, or perhaps you're kind of new to church from home and you want to let us know that you're watching every week. We want to connect with you and help you feel part of the family. So you can go to immersechurch.life and let us know and we'll be in touch. We'd also love you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook, connect in with us. That way you stay up to date with everything that's happening in the life of Immerse Church. But it's been great to have you this morning for us to be in your homes. We don't take it for granted and we're so grateful that you spent the time today to worship with us. And we're going to go out singing a song together. The band are going to come, they're going to lead us. So why don't you stand where you are and let's worship God together. This is my breakthrough. I'm